I wanted to invite you to open the scriptures with me this morning to Isaiah chapter number 41. Isaiah chapter number 41, and we'll begin there with verse number 21 when you get there. Isaiah 41 and verse number 21. I contemplated reading the whole chapter this morning, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I thought we'd... Uh, focus a little more. <laughs> That's one of the hardest parts with, uh, with public speaking of any type, and especially with preaching, uh, is that it's very difficult at times to limit yourself. <laughs> because, uh, you know what, there's 1189 chapters in the Bible, and they're all good. Mm -hmm. There's more than 31,000 verses in the Bible, and guess what? They're all good. Amen. And so I, I'm trying to limit myself a little bit this morning to try and uh, hold ourselves to a, a bite-sized chunk, uh, rather than getting into uh, more than maybe we can uh, manage this morning. So, we're going to look at this passage of scripture here in Isaiah chapter number 41. Now, uh, if you're familiar with the prophet Isaiah, who's a faithful man of God who preached in the nation of Judah for many years. He labored under several different kings. In fact, in the beginning of the book, it tells us uh, that it, he was a prophet to Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Now, this latter portion of the book of Isaiah is believed to have been written uh, after the time of Hezekiah, perhaps even into the reign of Manasseh, the king of Judah. Now, when we look at the scriptures uh, and see those different kings that I mentioned to you a moment ago that Isaiah preached under their, their kingship, uh, Uzziah started off as a really good king and ended badly. <laughs> Jotham and Ahaz uh, had differing reigns. Ahaz was very bad. And then Hezekiah, he started off really good. And then the latter portion, he made some bad decisions. But then his son Manasseh was probably the worst king that the nation of Judah ever had. And so as you look at the variety of different uh, rulers and time periods in which Isaiah preached, there's a lot of different groups, a lot of different uh, environments in which he preached. There was a lot, a long time period there and a lot of cultural change that was going on all around him. And in this portion, um, I, I should mention too, it didn't say Manasseh there in the beginning of the chapter, but the Jewish traditions tell us that uh, Isaiah was eventually um, uh, martyred under the reign of King Manasseh. Um, it's not recorded in scripture, so I can't be dogmatic about that, but it, uh, it's certainly true that at many points in Isaiah's ministry, uh, his message was unfavorable to certain people and, and to many of the people. And so that's why we have the context here of what we're going to see in this passage of scripture. Um, Manasseh was a king who had come to the throne and undone a lot of the good things that his father had done. And in cleansing the land of idolatry, Manasseh brought a lot of that back. And so we're going to see here that God is going to uh, have a controversy with Israel or with the nation of Judah and the people that, uh, that were rejecting the truth that Isaiah had been preaching for so long. All right, let's start with our text in verse number 21. God says, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work is not. An abomination is he that chooseth you. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun, shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay, who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say, he is righteous. Yea, there is none that showeth, yea, there is none that declareth, yea, there is none that heareth your words. The first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings. For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor, that what I asked of them could answer a word. Behold, they are all vanity, their works are nothing, their molten images are wind and confusion. All right, let's pray. Fathers, we look at the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem this morning, and what you spoke in words to them. We pray that our hearts would be tender to the truth, that our hearts would be guided by your spirit. Father, enable me as I speak, I pray that uh, every word that's given and every understanding would be led of you, that our lives would be helped and instructed as we seek your truth. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, so we're here in this passage of Scripture, and God is calling to the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. And our text started in verse number 21. He said, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. And so we're going to look at this text of Scripture this morning and find that in this passage of Scripture, uh, God had a proper demand of the people uh, to produce their cause, to bring forth their strong reasons, why they had come to such drastic transition uh, from what they had practiced and believed before. Uh, there had been some drastic changes in their lives uh, and in the reign of the, the, the situation of the nation. Now, God had a right to demand this. Uh, he was their king. He was the Lord. In verse 21, it uses the name Lord in your King James Bible. It's all capitalized to indicate that that's a translation for the word Jehovah, the self-existent God who appeared to Abraham uh, in so many years before. He also refers to himself in verse 21 as the king of Jacob. Uh, Jacob was a prince with God, and God was his king. Mm -hmm. And his descendants were called upon and led to follow that same king, the Lord God who created them. And so God gives this proper demand to inquire of them, why have you gone on the path that you've gone? Why have you chosen uh, the way of life and the way of belief that you've chosen? He asks them, first of all, uh, why uh, they were worshiping the statues and idols that they were worshiping. Why they were following after the things that they were following after. In verse 22 and 23, he, he asks them for supernatural outcomes. The, the statues and idols are being inquired of, can you do anything? In verse 30, uh, 23, he says, show the things that are to come hereafter. You know, can your idols produce a prophecy that will tell us what will happen? Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them. And know the latter end of them, or declare us things to come. Verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Uh, he's calling upon these gods that they had chosen to worship and prioritize and, and demands, can you do anything? Give us a message. You know, give us an answer. Give us some, some declaration. Can they speak? Well, we know the idols can't speak. Yeah. They have mouths, but they cannot speak, the Bible says. Yeah. Can they speak? Can they speak truth? Can they speak the future? You know, one of the greatest evidences for the validity of the scripture that we have before us this morning is fulfilled prophecy. There are so many clear prophecies given in the scriptures that were fulfilled in the finest details. Some of the prophecies are just astounding. We will see that a little bit in this passage of scripture this morning. But he says, you know, can you guys, you idols, you statues, what have you got? Can you tell the people what's going to happen in the future? Can you give uh, an answer? Or, or can you do anything? In verse 23, do good or do evil that we may dismay and, and behold it together. He says, can you do anything? Can you do something? Now, these people had turned to these idols from the living God. They had had the truth. They had had the scriptures. They had had a revelation of God. And they had turned to something of lesser value. Mm -hmm. You and I today don't look at uh, too many people around us worshiping statues. Mm -hmm. It's not a common practice in uh, Western Canada, uh, you know, Western culture here in Canada today. Uh, it's not a common thing. Uh, I, I don't knock on a lot of doors and find people, you know, bowing to statues in their living room. It just, mm -hmm. I've never seen that, okay? Maybe you have, I haven't. Uh, it's not that common here. But there are other things that we bow down to, mm -hmm. that we put our confidences in. It might not be a statue in our living room or in a temple in, in the community somewhere, but there are things that we do bow down to. Mm -hmm. uh, just this week, there was an online magazine published their 11th uh, uh, issue. It's called Forward Magazine. It's a Christian publication uh, produced by uh, independent Baptists and Christians here in Canada. And uh, I've got one of my articles is in there, and it's actually on this theme of idolatry mm -hmm. and how that we fall into uh, different types of idolatry than we might think. So you can, you can go online and check that out later. If you look up Forward Magazine, you'll find that. But we can fall into bowing down our lives to a lot of other things other than God. A lot of things that take the place of God in our life that we put our confidence in, we put our trust in. And God says, produce your cause and bring forth your strong reasons. Why are you prioritizing that over me? Can that save you in your time of trouble? 
Can that give you answers and direction and truth? Can that tell you what's going to happen down the road in the future? Can that give you real supernatural help? And the answer is, of course not. People today put a lot of confidence in a lot of things. They might put it in philosophy. They might put it in uh, their occult horoscopes and, and practices like that. They might put it in their literature. They might put it in good luck. They might put it in a lot of things. Their confidence is put in a lot of places. But can those things really transform in a more than natural way? Of course not. Why those statues? Well, or why he could ask, why are you putting so much confidence in the people around you? Why society? Sometimes we put so much confidence in the people around us, whether it's our family, whether it's our friends, whether it's even our church family or other believers, whether it's our government, our society, our community, we can put a lot of confidence in humanity, but no matter how well-intentioned those people are and how much we love and appreciate them and how much they may have been a blessing to us or want to be a blessing to us, they are a flawed substitute for a dependence upon God. You know, we can look to the situations and say, I hope this person comes through for me. I hope this thing comes through for me. I hope that they take care of me and this is going on and that everything just keeps going the way that I expect it to. But you know what? In, in this world, there is so much uncertainty. Cultures change. Governments change. People let you down. Everything that is based upon man is uncertain. God demands to know why in the world we would put so much confidence in the world in which we live instead of trusting in the Lord? Why would we put so much confidence in the wisdom of the world instead of following after the wisdom of the Lord? In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Mm -hmm. Our world is constantly trying to seduce us from the simplicity which is in Christ. Uh, the right. Bible has so much clarity for us, and the world likes to muddy the waters. The world likes to confuse us with all these weird ideas, all these strange philosophies. I mean, there's a million conspiracy theories and weird things that are all throughout this world that are just passed off and trying to muddy the waters. Sometimes people just like to talk for the sake of talking, mm -hmm. and sometimes people create their own nonsense, not even because they believe in it. Uh, I've told you before about the guy who started a new religion um, called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. How many of you have heard of that one? The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. He was an atheist who was trying to mock Christianity. And so he created this religion that this flying spaghetti monster came from outer space and that these, they call themselves Pastafarians. Um, they worship the great spaghetti monster by wearing spaghetti strainers on their head. And they've actually gotten themselves recognized as a real legitimate religion. Even um, people in, in some, some of the followers have gotten the, the legal right to wear their pasta strainer for their driver's license photos and things like that. Like, they don't even believe it. And there's people out there who are promoting all kinds of stuff that they don't even believe. It just gets them popularity, it just gets them an audience, it just gets them hits and views and likes and all kinds of nonsense. Don't fall for the lies of the world. Put your confidence in the Lord and in the scriptures. Okay, there's a lot of craziness out there. Don't put all your trust and confidence in society. It is dangerous to trust in the things of man. God says, Produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. Why would you trust in all that man has to give you instead of just trusting in the Lord? Instead of just trusting in the word of God, instead of leaning upon him. Why would we trust in our statues? Why would we trust in our society? And why would we trust in ourselves? Mm -hmm. We can put so much confidence in ourselves. I can do it. I can figure it out. I've been through tough stuff before. I'll make it. I'm okay. I got it covered. I can manage. I'll just, you know, I'll just try harder. I'll just work smarter. I'll just push through, I'll, I'll, you know, get a little more character. I'll just, I'll, I can do this. We cannot trust in ourselves. We cannot bring forth good reasons for why we would trust in ourselves. <laughs> uh, we are so frail and weak. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Our righteousness is of our own strength. The Bible tells us even here in the book of Isaiah are like filthy rags in the sight of God. They are unclean and invaluable. No, I don't mean invaluable, undaluable. We need to be so clear in understanding in our hearts and lives mm -hmm. that we can't just trust in our frailty. We need to lean upon God's finality. Yeah. The clarity that we need to understand is that when it comes to our ability to produce, we are trading our barrenness 
for God's bounty. What is it that we need in our lives as we walk with the Lord? We are fruitless of our own strength. We are feeble in our own abilities. God says to his people, produce your cause. You know, bring me an argument here. Bring forth your strong reasons. What you're doing does not make sense. I was just talking with somebody this week about something that, that they were going through. And I said, you know what? Actually, it makes a lot more sense for you to do it this way. And they said, I know. <laughs> I know it makes a lot more sense for me to do it that way. And sometimes we're in those situations of life where what we're doing, what we're trusting in, what we're leaning on makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And God calls his people to come to reason with them yeah. and say, do you have any reasons? Yeah. Think about this for a minute. Think through your life. Think about what you're trusting in, what you're prioritizing, what you're living for. Is that really what's valid? And it's important for us to understand God's call upon our lives to, to come to him with reason. To come to him with what's right. To come to him with what's actually going to work in life. And say, wow, you know what? The answer really is the Lord. And so God has a proper demand of his people to say, you're wrong. Why in the world are you trusting in this? Yeah. To sort of shake them into, the, into their senses and say, can you give me a reason? You know, you've been trusting in these idols. What have they done for you? Have they solved your problems? Have they spared you from destruction? I mean, in the reign of Hezekiah, this recorded just a couple of chapters earlier than this, Hezekiah had faced destruction. The city of Jerusalem had faced annihilation from the Assyrian army. And did they turn to their idols? No, they turned to the Lord God of Israel. And you know what God did? He destroyed the Assyrian army. 185,000 soldiers were killed overnight by the angel of the Lord. And, and here they are, turning their back on a God like that to worship an idol, sitting in the corner. They cannot speak. They cannot hear. They cannot move. They cannot act. They cannot predict the future. And God says, bring forth a reason for this insanity. Amen. And sometimes the way that we live our lives is spiritual insanity. Because we put our confidence and our strength and our decisions and our priorities in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. And God here is challenging them to think through what really is true, yeah. what really matters, what really is the truth. And so that's God's proper demand. The second thing I want to talk about this morning, uh, oh, I did want to mention a couple of verses also in Job where God calls on Job to give an account for his confidence. He says, gird up now thy loins like a man, and I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. In Job 38, verse 3. A couple chapters later, he says, gird up thy loins now like a man, and I will demand of thee. Declare thou unto me. Mm. He says, all right, give me an answer. Yeah. And we sometimes are called upon by God to give an answer as well. So the second thing we're going to look at is God's perfect design. Because the truth is that as we look at this passage of Scripture, God had a perfect way of... of providing exactly what they needed. God had a way of giving answers and giving direction and giving truth. I wanted to go back to the beginning of the chapter a little bit um, and look at the first three verses here. The first three verses of the chapter say, Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let, them, uh, let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, calling him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Now, this passage is a little bit confusing if you're not sure what's going on here. He's talking about somebody, he says, a righteous man who would come from the east and have mighty victory in battle. Now, I want to connect that because God was preparing a savior for his people long before they knew that they were going to need it. Now, when he talks about a righteous man coming from the east, this is talking about a man who was going to do what God had commanded for him to do. God was preparing a savior before they were ready and before even they understood how much they needed it. He prepared a prince who would bring freedom and who would bring victory for his people. Now, I wanted to turn over a couple of pages to chapter 44. Chapter number 44 and verse 28. And we'll look through to chapter 45 and verse 1. It's just two verses there. Isaiah 44, it says, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, 
and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I believe that in Isaiah 41, that this righteous man coming from the east was this King Cyrus that God had said would be a help to his people. Now, you got to understand, when we look at this scripture, we might come to it with a familiarity to understand that in the book of Ezra, we do see King Cyrus, the Persian king, giving the order to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and to reestablish the city of Jerusalem. And we understand that if we're familiar with, this, with the chronology of scripture. But it helps us to understand that when God gave this prophecy to Isaiah, here in Isaiah 44 and verse 45, or 44 and 45, we have to understand that Jerusalem had not been destroyed yet. I mean, the temple had not been destroyed yet. And God is already telling them who's going to give the order to rebuild something that hasn't even been destroyed yet. Mm -hmm. They had not yet gone into captivity yet. They had not yet lost the city. And God is already prophesying hundreds of years in advance that Cyrus will be the name of the man who will make that proclamation. Yeah. Who will say in verse 28 to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. This is what happened. You can go to, uh, go to the book of Ezra later and read the story about that in Ezra chapter 1. King Cyrus making the decree. 200 years in advance, Cyrus is prophesied by the Lord by name mm -hmm. that he will be the one to do the work. And this is such a tremendous contrast, isn't it? In chapter 41, God says to these idols and these statues, all right, can you guys tell us what's the future? <laughs> what does the future hold? And then a couple chapters later, God is very clearly making a very specific promise that will be fulfilled about 200 years in the future. I mean, Cyrus hadn't been born yet. Cyrus's granddaddy hadn't been born yet, okay? I mean, we're talking a huge chunk of history. If I was going to tell you who was going to make a specific legal decree 200 years from now by name, You'd think I was a lunatic to try and predict that. Yeah. What are the odds of predicting somebody's name who's going to make a certain prediction, to, uh, make a certain declaration 200 years from now? Mm -hmm. I don't even know what the world's going to look like in 200 years. I mean, honestly, 200 years? I don't know what countries are going to exist or not exist in 200 years. Yeah. And yet God very clearly says, you need somebody to trust in, and that is me. I can be trusted. I can tell you the end from the beginning. I mean, from the beginning, God already knew what the end looked like. He knew what was coming. He knew what was going to happen. He knew how he was going to orchestrate events so that those Medes and Persians could overthrow the Babylonians who took the nation of Judah into captivity. And after 70 years, they would be released and that the man who would make the, prof uh, the proclamation to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple of God would be named Cyrus and that he would have the authority and power to do so. That he would send God's people back after 70 years. They would all be planned out and accomplished. Yeah. God had the ability to prove and, and validate his reality. Now, you would think that, that the nation of Judah, looking at this passage of scripture after this, this proclamation by Cyrus, would look back and say, wow, mm -hmm. God knew it all. Yeah. He had it all laid out. He had it all figured out hundreds of years before. He told us exactly what was going to happen and who was going to do it by name. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the coolest prophecies in scripture to me. You would think that looking back on that, they would say, wow, we can just trust God with anything. Mm -hmm. And we can. Amen. Yeah. You and I can trust God with anything. That's right. He knows the end from the beginning. Yeah. He sees it all. He is orchestrating events in this world that are beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with playing chess. I, I, when I was young, I was a teenager. I was in a chess club for a little while. I know that makes me sound like a nerd, right? Um, <laughs> But chess is really complicated and really interesting. Um, I don't, I haven't played much chess in a long time, but I do remember one time sitting down with a guy um, just visiting and he said, oh, I like playing chess. Do you like playing chess? I'm like, oh, I like playing chess. Chess is great. And we played two or three games and he destroyed me. <laughs> I mean, every single game, it was embarrassing. He really, really destroyed me. And the reason was, is because I was thinking two or three steps ahead. And I think he was thinking about six steps ahead. <laughs> 
he had me dancing around that chessboard like a puppet. I mean, he just, he played games with me. It was embarrassing. But we need to understand that in this world, God is moving pieces yeah. hundreds of years before we know that they need to be moved. Yeah. Okay? We have a God who can do things that are far beyond our understanding. Amen. He knows it all. We can trust him. We can lean on him. We can depend upon him. We can live our lives with absolute confidence in the surety of our God. And that's what God is telling to these people. He says, you've got your trust in all this other junk. Why don't you just trust in me? I've got it all figured out. And you and I put so much confidence at times in all these different things. We put our confidence in our society. We put our confidence in the rule of law. We put our confidence in our friends and family. We put our confidence in the, the, the science and technology and medicine of our day. We put our confidence in our insurance company. We put our confidence in the stock market or in our bank or in our, our cash system. We put our confidence in all kinds of different things when I'm not saying any of those are necessarily bad things, but our ultimate confidence needs to be in the Lord. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because this world could completely collapse all around us, but God is unshakable. Yeah. And God is sure and certain. And our confidence needs to be in the Lord. These people were facing this, the reality of their existence when God spoke to them and said, give me your, give me your cause, produce your cause, give me your strong reasons. Have you got any excuse for the nonsense that you're living? Because the truth of the matter is, it was a very short period of time between the reign of Manasseh ending and the people going into captivity. And as Isaiah gave this message, it was not a terribly long time before they were going into captivity. Now, it was more than his lifetime. He didn't see that in his lifetime, neither did Manasseh. But they did see God's judgment come. And God said, I am going to predict exactly what's going to happen. God had a perfect design. But not only did God prophesy Cyrus, but I wanted to look at chapter 42 and starting in verse 1 and see that he predicted somebody greater than Cyrus. He predicted Christ. Isaiah 42 and verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment of the truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment of the earth, uh, judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. God was saying, I've got a great design. I'm going to use history and the peoples and the empires for my plan for my people. Yeah. But ultimately, I'm going to save you. Yeah. I'm going to send you a Messiah Amen. who can bring forth judgment unto truth and bring the revelation. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that, that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He brought the truth of salvation and he brought the grace to bring salvation to Amen. you and I. That was even more significant, that people could have their sins forgiven, they could be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that they could be born again by the power of Jesus Christ. Produce your cause, he says, for rejecting my design. That's so perfect. And I know that, you know, we could, this would be a great place for me to say, if there's somebody who has never trusted Christ as Savior, I could say, produce your cause. Why would you reject the gospel of Christ? I mean, Jesus Amen. Christ, God's only son, came and died in our place. Yeah. The righteous dying for the unrighteous. The Bible says he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It, 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 there's no sensible reason for anybody to reject the gospel of Christ. There's, there's no good reason. It's so real. It's so true. It's so powerful and transformative. And the spirit of God is at work in each heart who hears that message to bear witness to that truth. But for those of us also who are Christians, could we produce a cause for why we would reject the gospel of Christ? That might confuse you because you think, Pastor, I'm saved. I didn't re reject the gospel of Christ. No, but sometimes we reject the value of the gospel of Christ by not sharing it with anybody. Yeah. Can we produce a cause why we would do that? Mm -hmm. You got any strong reasons why you wouldn't share the gospel with people? Oh, we like to make excuses sometimes, but if God was to stand before us today and say, 
produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. Why do you undermine the value of my message mm -hmm. by not sharing it with others, with right. the people around you? Yeah. Produce your cause. God has a perfect design for the salvation of all who come to God by faith through Jesus Christ. Let's take that message to our world. Mm -hmm. The third thing that we're going to look at this morning is uh, God's people's defense. God's people's defense. Here in chapter 41, we see in verse 24, he says, Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work is of naught. It's of nothing. Of naught. Um, when we look at this passage of Scripture, God says that, that what these idols were producing, what these people were putting their trust in, he says it's of naught. It's from nothing. Um, the translators, when they were translating the King James Bible, they put a note in the margin there where it says, of not. And their, their marginal note says, it could also be translated this way, worse than nothing. Mm. Worse than nothing is another way to translate that same Hebrew phrase. This is what they were putting their trust in. Worse than nothing. I mean, nothing is bad, but worse than nothing is really bad. I would rather have nothing on my dinner plate than something that's worse than nothing. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? You can have bad, bad things. That's what they were putting their confidence in. Something that was not only neutral like nothingness, but something that was corruptive and destructive to their very existence. Yeah. was worse than nothing. In verse 28, For I beheld, and there was no man. Even among them was there no counselor. That when I asked of them could answer a word. God says, I've asked you this. Produce your cause, bring for your strong reasons. And in verse 28, it says, I got no answer. Yeah. There was nobody who could give me an answer on that question. Yeah. Because there is none. That's right. Amen. There's, there's no answer to that question. Nobody can stand up and say, ah, yes, God, but you have failed us here and you've not proved true and you don't know what's going on. Nobody could give an answer to that. That's right. And, and neither can we. Can we come before God and say, well, I, I know the Bible says I should live this way, and I know that I should do this, and I should trust the Lord, but I've got a good reason. Do you think that will stand up in the court of heaven? No. No, just trust the Lord. Amen. In verse 24, ye are of nothing, your work of none. An abomination is him that chooseth you. Their strength and their works were empty. They could produce nothing without the Lord. And so also could you and I. We ought to depend our lives upon the Lord. We ought to put our trust and confidence in the Savior. Lean upon Him day by day. Stand before Him with a humble acknowledgement, God, I need you desperately. And all that this world puts their confidence in is just grass before the flame next to what we have that we can build our lives upon. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, some people will build their house of their life on sand mm. and when the storm comes and the winds blow yeah. and the floods come it's all washed away yeah. but he said those who hear my words and do them mm. he says I will liken him to a man that builds his house upon a rock yeah. now we live in Muskoka we know a thing or two about bedrock right here I mean if anybody knows about building on a rock <laughs> I think we've got, got some understanding about that here man you build a building and you pin it to that bedrock mm. Uh, I don't care how hard the wind blows. I don't care what rains we get and what storms we get. There's strength there. Yeah. That rock is not moving. Right. It's not. Build your life on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Build your life on the scriptures. Yeah. He will not fail you. He will not be shaken. And you and I don't know what tomorrow holds. But like the hymn writer wrote so long ago, we know who holds tomorrow. Amen. We know who holds our hand. And as we walk with the Lord today, trust in the Lord. Don't put your confidence and your dependence upon all these frailties of this world. Amen. All the things that people put all their confidence in. There's one thing we need. It's just a closer walk with the Lord. Amen. Let's pray and ask his guidance this morning. Father, thank you for your truth and your word and the challenge that you gave to those people so many years ago. Lord, may we not be like those who heard that message from the prophet and ignored it. Father, may we be like those who not too long after Manasseh reigned, like Josiah, who found a copy of the scriptures, who got right with the Lord, who made changes and turned his nation. May we be those 
who even this morning would make a decision to say, I, I cannot stand on my own. I'm going to trust the Lord. I cannot depend upon the things of this life. I'm going to lean upon my Savior and know that his hand is strong. Father, may, may none of us leave our seats this morning without doing business with you. Mm. But as we walk with you in this hour, mm. that your hand would be upon us. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.